You will hear a man called Ken talking on the phone to a friend called Liz about holiday accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello? Hi Liz, it's Ken here. Hi Ken, nice to hear from you. Are you... This is just a quick call. But Mary and I have just been talking about our summer holiday. We haven't booked a place yet, and we've left it a bit late. We were just wondering if you know of any holiday rentals in your area. It's so nice there. Well, yes. I can think of two or three places that are very nice. What dates have you got in mind? The 10th of July to the 22nd of July. Oh, yes. That is quite soon, isn't it? Well... There's a place near here called Moonfleet. Is that M double O N F L double E T? That's right. It's quite a rural location, and it's next to the owner's house, but it's got fields all around it, so it's very pretty. Hmm. Sounds okay. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Well, it's an annex to the owner's house, and it's an apartment with two bedrooms and an open-plan living area. Well, I like the sound of it. Is there anything we might not like about it? Well, it's quite a distance from the nearest shops, that's all. OK. And... Well, I'll tell Mary, but I don't think she'd mind that. Do you know how you book it? You have to book on the internet. There's a web address. It's www.summerhouses. One word? Yes. Then dot com. You'll be able to look at a photograph on that. OK. And what about the others? Where are they? The second one I'm thinking of is called Kingfisher, and that's even more rural. It's a really beautiful location, in fact. It's by the river, and it's got nice views. It overlooks woodland on the other side. Is that an apartment? No, it's a three-bedroomed house, and that's got a dining room, as well as a separate living room and a kitchen. But I expect it's more expensive. You'll have to check the prices. Hmm. It's probably a bit bigger than we need. But our nephew might be joining us. We're not sure yet. How do you book Kingfisher? You have to phone the owner directly. Shall I give you the number? I've got it here in my phone book. It's 01752 669 218. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And you mentioned a third place? Yes, there's a house that my sister stayed in last year. It's called Sunnybanks. Nice name. And the location of that one is rather different. It's in the centre of a village, but it's a very small and quaint place. Did your sister like it? Oh, yes. It's by the sea, so her children really loved it. What's the accommodation like? I'm not sure about the number of rooms, because I haven't been in it myself, but I think she said it's quite spacious, and I know it's got its own garden. It's not very big, but it's not shared with anyone else, and it's supposed to be very pretty. Any snags? Problems? The only other thing I can think of is that there's nowhere for parking. The streets are too narrow, so you have to leave your car somewhere else, and then walk to the house. It's only about ten minutes away, but... OK. Well, I don't think it matters personally. How do you book it? 
There's an agent you have to contact. I don't know his details, but I can ask my sister and let you know tomorrow. Thanks, Liz. That'd be great. I'll talk to Mary and see what she says. Thanks for your help. That's okay, Ken. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. I hope you find what you're looking for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, and thanks everyone for coming here today. I know it's always a bit stressful going for a job interview, but it's best to be prepared. For any of you who may not know me, my name is Fiona Ogilvie, and my job is to offer guidance and support for students with special needs. Now, you wouldn't be here today if you weren't interested in finding a job in the holidays. So let's get down to it and see what things you need to be looking out for. Most of you, I hope, will be applying for jobs with the companies that have been recommended by the university. The reason for this is that we here at the university already know these companies and have established good working relationships with them. I've also been to visit all of them and checked out the facilities they have to offer. You really need to make informed choices when you're looking for a job and make sure you know before you even get to the interview stage that your needs will be met. But I know that some of you are applying for jobs independently and have looked at companies outside the university recommended list, so for you it's best to plan ahead and be aware of what it is you may need while you're working. Things that you need to check when you go for an interview are Are there enough toilet facilities and are these easily accessible? Also, you want to check that all the public areas inside the building are barrier free so you can get direct access to these public spaces whenever you need to. And ask about ramps into the building, so you know how many there are and where they are located. These kinds of things are so much more difficult to sort out when you've started work, as they take time. But ramps are an absolute must, so please make sure you know where they are. Another thing you must make sure of is that the lifts have the correct lowered control panels. Ask if all the lifts have this facility, or if it's only certain ones. Now, something I think that is often overlooked is working hours. What you want to make sure of is that you get flexi time. This basically means that your working hours are flexible and you can clock on and clock off in times that suit you. Within reason, of course. Most companies do recognize that it takes much longer for someone in a wheelchair to get on and off buses and trains. Public transport can take that much longer, so you need to be organized and prepared. And for those of you lucky enough to own a car, check how many disability parking spaces are available. Remember that it's your right to have a disabled parking space. These also need to be near enough to a wheelchair accessible entrance or ramp. OK, are there any questions before we move on? 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Right, let's move on then. Now I want to talk you through the series of visits to companies which we've got planned for next week. On Monday morning, we will be visiting the Lowland Hotel. They have various summer jobs available, working as a receptionist or conference organiser in their busy conference centre, organising and setting up conferences. You need to be prepared for working in an office environment and spending quite a bit of time talking on the telephone. The bus leaves for the hotel at 9 a.m., so make sure you leave yourself plenty of time to get there. When you arrive at the hotel, please gather in the reception area and wait for someone to take you to your first session, which will be a talk. The talk at the hotel will begin at 10 a.m., and then there will be a short tour of the hotel. There will be a light lunch provided, which is usually salads and sandwiches. The next place we'll be visiting will be on Tuesday afternoon. We'll be going to visit a little local company that makes handmade paper and cards. For those of you studying art, this may be just what you're looking for. We'll be taken on a tour of the company which lasts three hours. The tour will start at 3.30 p.m. and after that you'll have a chance to meet some of the staff. Tea and coffee will also be provided. We have no trips planned for Wednesday, but on Thursday morning we'll be going to Tobago Travel Agency. This is a very popular choice amongst our students because you can get student discounts on holidays. We've booked a coach for this and it'll leave from outside the refectory at 8 a.m. You'll need to bring a packed lunch for this, so please don't forget. There is a little canteen where you can buy hot and cold food, but this is closed on Thursdays. Friday, we'll be having representatives from all the companies visiting us, so you will have a chance to ask any questions, and of course, put your name down on the list if you're interested in working for them over the summer. This event will take place in the main hall next to the library, and it'll run from 10.30 until 4. I really hope you make the most of this excellent opportunity to not only earn yourself some extra money, but also to gain experience of what it's like to work. And if you'd like to find out more, then please ask some of the students who worked last year. They're all wearing green badges and will be happy to speak to you afterwards. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. 
In the 8th century, the Chinese invented paper and woodblock printing. Remember that up to this time, very few people could read and write, and so only a very small number of people could understand written history. Suddenly, many books appeared, and many more people learnt to read. In the 14th century, the first printing press was invented in Germany. This reduced how long it took to produce books. The new printing technique quickly spread to other parts of the world. More books appeared, and even more people learnt to read. The first printed newspaper appeared in 1605. And the first daily newspaper in 1702. Now, people could read news stories soon after the event happened, and every event was recorded and stored. The problem with newspaper history is that newspaper reporters could tell the stories they wanted to tell, and not necessarily the truth. Photography was the next important development. We generally agree that photography was born in 1839. Some of the earliest photographs that the public saw were images of the American Civil War. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. People were shocked by the photographs of dead soldiers and for the first time saw the reality of war. By 1850, photographs appeared regularly in newspapers and people now expected the truth. At the end of the 19th century came the first motion picture camera. Soon, history was being recorded as moving images. In the 1930s, television brought moving images into people's homes. More and more people saw history as it happened, and more and more history was recorded. Today, of course, we expect that every event in the world is recorded. Satellite TV and the internet allow people to watch any event. Anywhere in the world, as it happens. It doesn't matter if the TV cameras are not there. People carry around mobile phones and can record any incident and then share it online. Families have their own video cameras and record their own history. Children now grow up watching their parents and grandparents on film. I'm sure you'll agree that the transition from storytelling to what we have today has been dramatic. And I hope that. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Now listen to the second part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Now let's turn to shopping, which may interest you more. In general, shops open at 9 o'clock in the morning and close at 5.30 in the afternoon. In country towns and quieter suburbs, smaller shops close for an hour at lunchtime, and once a week there tends to be an early closing day when most shops shut during the afternoon. Many cities have a late night once a week when shops stay open until approximately 8 o'clock in the evening. You should ensure that anything you bring into the country, such as travelling irons, heated rollers, hair dryers and electric shavers, can be used on the standard British voltage, which is 240 volts, 58 Z. Many hotels will, on request, be able to supply adapters for electric shavers. When you travel, you may want to send postcards home. Stamps can be bought at post offices throughout Britain. They are open from 9 o'clock to 5.30, Monday to Friday, and until 12.30 on Saturday. Stamps can also be bought at postal centre stamp dispensers, at large stores and major tourist attractions. For posting letters, you don't have to go far before finding a red painted letterbox. Alternatively, use the letterboxes at post offices. You may ask how much to tip in hotels and how much it is for a taxi. There are no fixed rules on tariffs about this and the following is intended only as a guide to customary practice. Most hotel bills include a service charge, usually 10 to 12 per cent, but in some larger hotels, 15 per cent. Where a service charge is not included, it is customary to divide 10 to 15 per cent of the bill among the staff who have given good service. In restaurants, if a service charge is not included in the bill, then 10 to 15 per cent is usually left for the waiter. For porters, we usually give 30p to 50p per suitcase. For taxis, 10 to 15 per cent of the fare. Hairdressers, two pounds according to how much work they have done, plus 50p to the assistant who washed your hair. If you drive in Britain, you should remember to drive on the left and overtake on the right. The wearing of seat belts is compulsory for the driver and front seat passengers. Now let's talk about full details of Britain's road regulations. A copy of the Highway Code can be obtained from offices of the Automobile Association, AA, or Royal Automobile Club, RAC, at most ports of entry. These two motoring organisations can also provide plenty of helpful information to all motorists. Contact AA. Telephone is 01 854 7373 24 hour service. RAC telephone is 0304-204-256, 24-hour service. For something more serious, telephone operators will give you the telephone number and address of a local doctor's surgery. Alternatively, you can go to the casualty department of any general hospital or, in the case of severe emergency, dial 999. 999 is free. Remember, unless you belong to a European community country or one with which the UK has reciprocal health arrangements, you will be charged for the full cost of medical treatment in Britain, except in the case of accidents or emergencies requiring outpatient treatments only. It would therefore be wise to take out full medical insurance before leaving home. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.